Thanks for doing this. Thank you. Is this real? This is real. Really? This is really real. I'm looking at it very, very seriously. I'll make a decision soon. Politicians are all talk, no action. I deal with them all the time. I've done very well with politicians. I will tell you, Brett, our country is going to hell. We have people running the country that don't know what they're doing. This is absolutely real. And you see it a little bit in the polls. I do great in the polls. The one that just came out today, do great, beat most of them. And then they say, but he's not running. And I still do well in the polls. So let's see what happens. If I announce, it's going to be very interesting. People look at you and say, hey, listen, he's successful. He's got a lot of things going. He's on TV. Um, why do this? Why put yourself through this? Why put your family through this? A lot of people ask me that question. And my family, to a certain extent, asks me that question. We have a great life. I've built a great, great company. You've seen that when I did filings. You'll see even better if I do other filings. I mean, it's a phenomenal country, company. And this is really what the country needs. It needs a certain type of thinking. We owe $18 trillion. We're going to $21 trillion and ultimately $24, which is a magic word. You know, $24 trillion, that's the magic number. That's like the point of no return. And we're there very quickly. We're going to end up being another Greece, and maybe we're going to end up being another Detroit, because that's where our country is going. We need proper leadership. Well, let's talk about some issues, first of all. Immigration. Right. How do you deal with you it? You've got to stop the border. You've got to clog up that border. You have to stop Mexico from sending everybody over here. People don't realize Mexico is not our friend. They have done a number on us like very few people have done. We have to build the wall. We have to stop people from coming in, and you have to stop it now. We can't afford it. The wrong people are coming. You have people coming that are gang members, that are murderers, that are killers. And you have some good people coming, certainly. But you have, they're not sending their good people. I mean, just think of it, the country. They're not sending, oh, gee, let's send wonderful people. They're sending their bad apples. And we're getting a lot of bad apples. And you go along that border and you see what's happening in terms of crime. You've got to clog up the border. We have to build a wall. Nobody can build a wall like Trump can build a wall, believe me. That's one thing everybody agrees on. What do you do with the 11 million plus here? Well, I believe in a merit system. It's very hard. And it's easy for me as a very conservative person to say, everybody has to get out. But you know from a human standpoint, that doesn't happen. But you know what? If they're bad, we throw them the hell out. And you have plenty of bad ones. In that 11 million group, you have a lot of bad ones. But you have some great ones. And I believe in the merit system. If somebody's done a great job and really done that wonderful job and had a productive period of time, you start letting them go through a system. But the bad ones, you get them out, and you get them out fast. And we have a lot of bad ones. National debt, you mentioned it. Um, it's a huge issue. How do you tackle it? Well, you tackle it easily. China is destroying this country. Other countries are destroying this country with trade. What's going on with trade in this country is unbelievable. You have to stop it because what they and, and it's all manipulation of currency. You know, we make better product than they make in China. But they manipulate their currency brilliantly, and they're taking away our jobs, they're taking away our manufacturing, and we have to bring it back. So we have to be strong on China, strong on trade. And does, how do you turn it around? I mean, obviously, a lot of politicians have talked about a lot of things. Um, some have talked about dealing with entitlements. Some have talked about a pro-growth agenda, but nothing seems to have turned it so around. Brett, we have tremendous potential in this country. But every country that does business with us rips us because we have people that are incompetent negotiators. I call Obama the five for one. That's a typical negotiation. We have one trader, one trader. We get him back and we give five killers that are out now trying to kill everybody, including this country. And they were leaders. They were really the ones they wanted, those five. That's called a trade. That's a bad trade. It's a terrible trade. Well, the trades on other countries, when we deal with China, when we deal with Brazil, when we deal with Mexico, when we deal with Japan, which is really starting to rear its head again, as you probably have seen and heard, and they're manipulating their currency very low. They're bringing it down. It's going to be very hard to compete. We have to have somebody that knows what they're doing. Politicians don't know. They don't understand. They don't have a clue. They talk. Now, I deal with politicians all my life. I've made a lot of money dealing with politicians. They're easy. They're all talk. They're no action. What they are great at is self-preservation. They keep their job. That's all they want to do, is keep their job. 
but they don't want to do good for the country. That I can tell you. Um, Health care. What do you do about Obamacare? Got to repeal it. It's got to end. It's a disaster. And don't forget, Obamacare doesn't really kick in. The negative impact doesn't kick in until 16. So Obama said, not only with certain companies and certain groups of people like Congress as, as to getting Obamacare, he didn't want it during his administration. Very smart. One of the smarter things, frankly, that he's done. It kicks in in 16. It's going to be a disaster. I believe in health care. You've got to take care of people. I have a big heart. I'm conservative with a very, very big heart. But Obamacare is a disaster. It's going to destroy the country. And it's bad, bad health care. It's horrible. So I would have a plan that would be a fabulous plan. But with all of that being said, you've got to take care of people. You have to repeal Obamacare. We have to come up with something much better and much less expensive, but at the same time better. Is it possible yes. to get Congress on the same page with yes. one thing? You have to get him in the room. You have to get him in the room. He doesn't talk to anybody. He writes executive orders because he can't get along with anybody. He doesn't talk to anybody. He doesn't even talk to the Democrats anymore. He's the executive order king. And then in five years, we'll find out whether or not it held up in the court system. Now, we have a disaster in this country. We have a president who is either incompetent or has bad intentions. I personally think he doesn't have bad intentions. I think he's incompetent. A lot of people disagree with me on that. But we are in big, big trouble in this country. Foreign policy. Uh, you've been critical of the Iran negotiations and this framework of a deal. What would you do? Well, let's take a look at that deal. There's another one of our great negotiations, whether it's five for one or Iran. Just a little thing. We have three people over there, probably four or five, but we have three people over there. You have the minister, you have a soldier. Wonderful people that shouldn't be over there. Why doesn't he say, like, at the beginning, hey, fellas, you're dealing with Iran, right? Fellas. Let them go. Let them go. Doesn't mean to think to you it's going to make us all look good. It's going to make me look good. It's going to make the country. You guys are going to. It's going to set off right. Let them go. It wasn't even mentioned during the negotiation. Don't mention it. Now, is it that important? To me, it's important. But is it that in the overall? You know, when you're talking about nuclear, no. But it sets a great little example. Fellas, let them go. They shouldn't be there. Come on. They'll do it. If I said to them, let them go, they do it. They don't even ask. Now, if you look at what's gone on with the plan, it's a disaster. We're not getting rid of nuclear. In fact, I think what's going to happen is the world is now going to arm with nuclear because of this. This is a disaster for our country. And also, when you look at what happened, their negotiator goes back, and in the streets all over Iran, they're celebrating. And he's like a big hero. He's like uh, Mickey Mantle just hit the big home run. The guy is being celebrated as, as, as a huge hero. They think they made a great deal. And you know what? They did. Nobody's celebrating over here, because even the ones that are saying it's OK, it's sort of very mixed. And I actually thought that what he was doing was setting the stage not to do a deal. Because I really thought, you know, he'd look really tough and smart if he walked out. And I was predicting maybe he'll walk out. But they're not smart. They're not. I wrote the book, The Art of the Deal, number one selling business book of all time. I think, pretty close, right? Almost everybody read it. Mm -hmm. This is not the art of the deal. This is a bunch of checker players playing with grandmasters. You know, the Persians and the Iranians—they're very, very good negotiators. And we have people that don't have a clue. I mean, I like John Kerry. He's a nice person. He's not a negotiator. So. It's very sad what's happening to the country. And I think, frankly, you just hit on it, the biggest issue facing the world is nuclear. And when people talk about global warming, in the meantime, you tell the people up in Boston about global warming, where they have 12 feet of snow and can't get out of their house. When Obama says the biggest issue facing us is global warming, the biggest issue facing us is nuclear warming, because that's the real warming. And if we don't have tough, smart people that know how to deal, you're going to have a catastrophe like never in the history of the world before. So the biggest problem confronting this country is nuclear. And the fact is, we have incompetent people representing us. So when the president says, well, what are you going to do? I mean, if you're not going to do this, are you going to go to war? What do you think of I that I think argument? the sanctions would just absolutely bring them to their knees. Now, 
If it doesn't, and if they want to do nuclear, then you're going to have to start dropping something on them very, very severely, because you're not — you cannot allow Iran to have nuclear. I mean, the general was on television two days ago saying the survival of Israel is non-negotiable. I mean, it's not going to — how can you do this? And then win negotiation? So they don't even control their own general. You know, these negotiators, in theory, are over and above the general. Well, how's he talking about it? He's saying we're going to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. And then you have Obama that doesn't even get along with Israel. And one of the amazing things, I have a lot of Jewish friends who supported Obama. They are absolutely saying, what the hell did we do? He's the worst thing that ever happened to Israel. So we need tough smart people. All we're doing with this negotiation is making Iran rich, because we're taking off the sanctions. They're going to become rich. Now, they're fighting us in Yemen. So wouldn't you think during the negotiation, I would say, listen, a couple of things. You've got to get out of Yemen fast. Just get out. Nobody even brought it up. They don't talk like that. You know, it only takes a few seconds. That statement takes a few seconds. And if it's properly delivered, they're going to get out. But we have a bunch of stiffs. We have in the business, we call them stiffs. We have a bunch of stiffs. We have people that are diplomats who don't want to offend anybody. They're very nice people. But they're not for this. They're not doing the job. And that job is the most important job. But you have a country that we're negotiating with, and they're fighting in Yemen, essentially fighting us. So it's, it's a very sad thing. Now, I, on your show, years ago, I said, that Iran was going to take over Iraq. Because I was never a big fan of what they did in Iraq, because I knew the Iraqis, once we leave, and who wants to stay there forever? And that's when I came up the thing. At least we get something, because we lost thousands of lives. We spent $2 trillion on the Iraq war, and wounded all over, all over New York, all over Florida. I see the wounded. I let them come to Mar-a-Lago. I have parties. I, have, I love those people, because they're braver than I am. But they're walking around without legs, without arms, and worse than that. And this is what we get for Iraq. We got nothing. So you remember, I said, keep the oil. Everyone said, oh, you can't say that. That's such a terrible thing. Not everybody. The smart people didn't say that. But the people that don't know what they're doing said, oh, it's a sovereign country. Well, Iraq has the second largest oil reserves in the world after Saudi Arabia. People don't know that. Massive. I said, keep the oil. We didn't keep the oil. You know who has the oil now? ISIS. They have the oil. And the other one is Iran soon will have the oil, because they're basically taking over Iraq, which is what I said. I said, Iran's going to — and I said this five years ago. I didn't say this, like, two days ago. And you know it, because you interviewed me, and I said it. And a lot of people said, no way. You know, you had two countries that were sort of equal. They were — you know, you go five feet this way, five feet this way. They fight for 10 years, then they both get tired, and they live, right? Well, we decapitated one of those two countries. So the other country is just going in and taking over. So Iran is really controlling Iraq right now. But between ISIS and Iran, they have all the wealth and they have all the oil. And it's not going to stop. The reason it's not going to stop is because they have no respect for our leadership. So that's the bottom line. You say establish respect. It affects Russia, Putin, negotiating China, Mexico. That's your sense. Well, Russia, I mean, I was with Putin a year ago. And I will tell you, I, I think he's a guy that can be dealt with. But he doesn't like Obama. He doesn't respect Obama. And I believe he's somebody that can be a dog. And if he can't, you do some heavy numbers on him and this and that, right? But I think that he is somebody that can actually be dealt with. I was over there. I own the Miss Universe pageant. And we had a tremendous success. It was in Moscow. And I got to meet many, many of the Russian leaders. And, hey, do you think they want war? They don't want war. Moscow was thriving. Now, all of a sudden, it's all messed up, but the relationship with this country is all messed up. But I met many of them because, intelligently, they all wanted to go and see the Miss Universe. So it was sort of easy to meet them, right? They all came into a room. But uh, we could get along with people, but we need proper leadership, and we need great negotiators. We have bad negotiators. We have people that are, you know, gave a political contribution and they get some job, and all of a sudden, they're negotiating nuclear weapons. We need great negotiators. We need smart people. We don't have them right now. <clears throat> Let's go back domestically. Taxes. As President Trump, what would you do? I wouldn't raise taxes. 
If anything, I'd lower taxes. And the reason is, we will, I will take, if there's going to be taxes, what I'm going to do is take back business from China, take back business from Vietnam, take back business from all these countries that are manufacturing. We're going to start manufacturing in this country. You know, in China, they make something, they sell it over here, no tax. We make something and sell it in China. Number one, you can't go through the red tape. It's almost impossible. Number two, there's a tax. A friend of mine was telling me the other day, he's in the manufacturing business. He makes something. He said, oh, the tax of China. I said, when we send a, I said, what do you mean? They charge you? They, they're charging you like a big tax? He said, it's a massive tax. If we're selling into China, it's a massive tax. When they sell into us, it's nothing. Because we have people that don't know what they're doing. And it's unfair. And our companies can't compete with that. You just can't compete with it. So I guarantee you there won't be devaluations of their currency when I'm around and if I decide to do this and if I win. And our country will become great again and our country will become rich again. Now, rich doesn't sound nice. People say, oh, that's a terrible thing to say. Our country's going to be rich. Well, without being rich, we can't be great. And I'd be the only Republican that would say, I'm not going to cut Social Security. I'm going to make it stronger, but I'm not going to cut it. I'm not going to cut Medicare or Medicaid. I'm not going to cut it. Because I will take in so much money, and we will make this country so powerful and rich again, and therefore great, that you won't have to cut Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. No, we'll get rid of the fraud, which is massive, and we'll get rid of the waste. But you won't have to cut it. So I'll probably be the only one that says that. <clears throat> So we, <clears throat> will you put out a specific plan if you're going to run? Sure. A tax plan? Sure. Corporate taxes, I'll do it. personal? I'll do it. I mean, you have to sort of go by your wits a little bit when you're in there, and you have to negotiate. So you can put out a plan, but you want to negotiate with Congress. You want to get along with them. You want to actually bring them over to the White House, or I'll go to them. I'd like to save some money because the guards, you know, everything when, when Obama. I'll give you an example. So two weeks ago, he goes to Hawaii. Goes to Hawaii. He takes Air Force One. His wife leaves almost at the same time. She takes another Boeing. So you have a Boeing 757, and you have a Boeing 747 going in the same direction almost at the identical time. Now, you tell me, is that right? Is that right? They go out to do television shows in the same area, Burbank. I guess it was Burbank, California. They're landing at, I believe, the same airport. One leaves an hour or two early. You don't think maybe Mrs. Obama or the President could have said, you know what, let's sort of take one plane. You know the kind of millions and millions and we're not talking about like for $5,000 more. We're talking about millions and millions of dollars. And that's what it is. One thing interesting, I talk about it and some people think, so I see the Chinese President and delegation is being honored at the White House during the Obama administration and they have a, a third-rate tent sitting on the White House lawn. It looks terrible, not good for security. So I call up David Axelrod. I say, David, I will give you, free of charge, a $100 million ballroom, and nobody builds them better than I build them. Mar-a-Lago, many of them. I'm building one right now on Pennsylvania Avenue that's going to be the talk of Washington, D.C., at the old post office site. I said, nobody builds better than I built. What I do best is build. I'm going to give you a $100 million ballroom. We can set up all sorts of commissions. You'll pick the look. You'll pick everything. We'll hire the five greatest architects. We'll have each one of them come in with a plan so that everybody's happy, because it is the White House. But you need to have a ballroom. I will give it to you free. No charge. You pick it. We'll design it. It'll be fantastic. Never heard back from them. You, you did the same with the UN. I did the same with the UN. So. The head of the Swedish delegation calls me up. He said, Mr. Trump, you just built a 90-story building across the street. And I read where it cost $325 million. We're spending $4 billion to renovate a much smaller building at the United Nations. Could I ask you, did I read that right? He says to me, did I read it? It cost $325 It's called Trump Tower. You know, it's, it's another Trump building, a great building, a great building. It's called Trump World Tower, right opposite the United Nations. Magnificent, got all sorts. Herbert Mouchamp of the New York Times, a great architectural critic, gave it rave reviews. Everybody loves it. Very successful. $325 million. It's actually 92 stories in terms of feet. It's 92 stories tall. So he called up. He said, how come you're spending 325 and we're spending $4 billion to fix up some building? I say, because of two reasons, corruption and incompetence. So I looked at their plan. I asked the major 
person that was in charge, are you using a boiler system or New York steam? He didn't know. Okay? Had no idea what he was even talking about. This is the guy that was in charge. So I said, two things. You have, you have very corrupt people there, and you have really corrupt, and you're very incompetent people. People are going to make a fortune. So I met with the head of the United Nations. I told him about the plan. And all he wanted to do was have pictures taken with photographers. In fact, I was sitting with him all by myself. All of a sudden, doors open, and there are like hundreds of photographers outside. I said, no, I thought I was just going to tell you about this thing. So all he wanted to do was that. That's all he cared about. I said, listen, I can save you about $3 billion. Now, billion with a B. Three billion. He said, well, what, the, what will the difference be between yours and theirs? I said, here's the difference. Mine will be better. I'll use marble. They're going to use terraza. Mine will be much better, much richer, a finer building, better in every way. It'll be a finer renovation. And you don't have to move out. They're going to occupy other buildings throughout the city while they did this. I said, I'll do five floors at a time. It works beautifully. I've done it before. I built the Grand Hyatt Hotel on 42nd Street. I did that. I've done it before. I said, you don't even have to move out. And you'll save three billion, three and a half billion dollars. And it's going to be a much better job and a much richer job. He said, oh, wow, thank you very much. Never heard from him. So these are the people we have running the country and, to a certain extent, the world. So you think that business experience can, can translate to the U.S. government? I don't think. I know. Of course it can. With heart. In fact, look at Obama with the African-American population. They've never done worse. Setting records for poverty, for unemployment, for everything. You would have thought, first black president, he would have been great for the African Americans. He's been a disaster. He's been a total disaster. I would get everybody working. Everybody would love it. And you wouldn't have to worry about minimum wage, because they'd be doing a lot better than minimum wage. But I'd take the jobs back from China. I'd take the jobs back from Japan, where they're sending cars in here by the millions. You never saw anything like it. The boats in New York, where I live. I say, man, look at that boat. Brand new, gorgeous. Japanese cars. Japanese cars. Now, we have another one. The new China is going to be Mexico, because Mexico is just eating our lunch. You know, they just took a big plant away from Tennessee. You heard that, probably. A billion-dollar auto plant going to Mexico. It was expected to go to Tennessee. They just decided to go to Mexico. So then Mexico makes it, rip us off, charge us tax, but when those cars are made in Mexico, they're sent to the United States tax-free, no problem. You know Stuff the, like that, Brett, would stop. You understand. You know the dig on you and the concern about you that this is all about the brand. Why is this time different than 1999 or 2007 or 2011 when you talked about it and looked at it? Why is Very this different? Simple. I looked at it twice. I looked at it twice. Um, I, the first time wasn't serious. Very, last time was very serious. I was very, very disappointed in Mitt Romney. You play golf. You play sports. You're a very good athlete. Some people choke. He choked. He failed. He should have done great. He should have beaten Obama. That was a race that should have been beaten. I love what I'm doing. I love building. I love the tremendous success of The Apprentice. I love all the things I'm doing. I fix things. I took the old post office. Where do you see it? In a year from now, it'll be the finest hotel in the country. This club is one of the most successful clubs. You know that. On the Potomac River, the whole place is on the longest stretch of privately owned land on the Potomac River. I own it. No partners, no anything. I fixed it. It's one of the most successful clubs in Washington, Virginia, Maryland. It's like there's nothing like it. I mean, it's a big, big success. Doral. It was a sick puppy. It's now the hottest resort in the United States. I fix it. I fix things. I make things better. I fix them. This country can be made great. It's not great right now. People laugh at us. And if I run, my slogan is, make America great again. I have to add the word again, because I have to do it. Make America great again. So I was very disappointed in Mitt Romney. He choked. I even called his people. I said, where are you? We had the hurricane. We had all the problems. And all of a sudden, I see Obama out there with Chris Christie and others. And he's, you know, the rain's pouring down. It'll look good. Hey, good for votes, OK? Does it mean anything? No, but it's good for votes. I said to Mitt Romney, why aren't you out there? He was sitting in his house for like a month. He didn't do anything. 
and he ended up losing the election. I see Obama, and I give him a lot of credit. I give Obama a lot of credit. He's on Jay Leno. He's on Fallon. He's on David Letterman. He's on all of them. I said, where are you? Why aren't you going on the shows? I think you're getting killed. And then I listened to Fox. You know, Karl Rove, who's a total, you know, he spent 436 million, didn't win one election. Okay, you explain that one. But I listened to Karl Rove, how Romney's gonna win. And I said, I don't think so, because I don't see Romney anywhere. I see Obama, but I don't see Romney. Even Brett Barrows, uh, uh, even um, Hannity, who's a great guy, he was telling me, you know, I tried to get him on the show. It's like, impossible. Couldn't get him on the show. That's a friendly show, in all fairness. Let's face it, it's a pretty friendly show to him. I wouldn't say that Obama likes it, but to him. But he disappeared for a month and he lost the election. And when I listened to Karl Rove, I respect Karl Rove, but when I listened to Karl Rove and others, they were all saying, like, the election's over. And I kept saying, I don't think so, because Obama's on all these shows. I mean, the night before the election, he's doing the whole circuit, and Romney's sitting in a house someplace. So something happened to Romney. I think he choked, to be honest with you. And I was very tough on him. I think I'm the one that kept him out of the race, because when he was going to run, Everybody said, oh, isn't that wonderful? And I said, we don't want a guy that chokes running again. He choked and let us down. Because I happen to think that it was easier to beat Obama, who was a failed president, than to beat Hillary right now. She's got her own problems. But I actually think it was easier to beat Obama, a failed president, than it is to beat Hillary, who's now a woman. And people are going to say, oh, we need a woman president with all of her flaws. He should have won that race, but he choked. I don't think he'll be endorsing me if I run. You <laughs> And I helped him a lot. By the way, I helped him. You know it. I helped him a lot. But I don't expect an endorsement. Christian Science Monitor. For Donald Trump, a presidential exploratory committee isn't a step. It's a phrase, a signal, a means of repeating the same teasing, maybe I'll run formulation he's used many, many times before. Well, it's a theme that you seem to keep coming up with, too. And other people do also. In fact, this recent poll that just came out from the university, the one today, it was everyone saying, wow, how could Trump be like I, most of the candidates? I'm beating almost everybody, right? You saw it. And they say he's not running. Now, that's a real negative. The only thing that's going to clear up your constant questions about that are, is going to be if I run. Well, it's not a constant think, question. Well, it is what, when, and, people, and, and you when you ask the people, only one, when you ask people and you go around the country, that's what they say. It's like, Okay, I've heard it before. Well, that's why they were so surprised that I did so well in the fall, and I understand it. But the one thing that will clear that up instantly, if I stand up and if I say, I'm running for president. Let's assume you do. Okay. People don't know a lot about your early years, yeah. where you grew up, what your family history is. Right. Give us the elevator speech. Well, I grew up in Queens. And my father was a builder in Brooklyn. He built houses, and he built some apartment buildings. And he was a great guy, and he was an excellent negotiator. I learned a lot about the art of the deal from watching him. And not even from watching him, from sitting down and playing with blocks at his feet as he's talking to a contractor. You know, you learn through osmosis. And he was a wonderful guy and had a wonderful mother who came from Scotland, 19, and they were married for 64 years and had a great marriage. Uh, they both lived a long life, had a great, great marriage. One of the, I guess, the greatest marriage I've ever seen. They just had this extraordinary marriage. And they were two unbelievable people. But so I was born in Queens. Uh, I went to the Wharton School of Finance, and uh, which is, I think, the greatest business school in the world. It's certainly many of the folks that you interview went there that are running the big companies today. And I learned a lot there, and I learned a lot about life generally, I think. And, I, I went out, I started working in Brooklyn with my father, and then I said, you know, I really want to go into Manhattan, Pop. I want to build the big buildings. I love those big buildings. And I used to look across from Queens and Brooklyn onto Manhattan, and that was a different Brooklyn than it is today, and even a different Queens. And I'd say, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to do. And you know, it's sort of like this, because he would tell me, that's not our territory, son. It's not our territory. It's not for us. We don't know anything about that. That's a different world, and that's a different league. I said, but that's what I want to do. And all my life, people have said, you know, gee, you just can't do that. And my father, with all great intentions, he didn't want to do that. And he didn't want to come with me. I actually had to do that because he didn't want to do that. Then ultimately, he was very proud because of what I built in Manhattan and what I built all throughout the world. We're building all over the world, and the company is amazing. And one of the things I love about 
announcing is I want to do a filing because nobody, you know, I'm a private company, so nobody knows. But the company is massive. It's got very little debt. It's got tremendous cash and tremendous cash flow. And I did that in a relatively short period of time. Another thing is The Apprentice. Everybody said, don't do it, don't do it. It'll never work, it'll never work. And until that time, you know, there's never been in the history of television a prime time, essentially, business show that worked. And my agent said, I won't allow you to do it. You're gonna embarrass yourself. It became the number one show on television. It did phenomenal ratings. And to this day, as you know, NBC, and they've been great to me, at least the real NBC. I wouldn't say NBC News, uh, uh, you know, I won't mention names, but they've been really great to me. NBC's a company I have great respect. Brian and Steve Burke and the whole group. I mean, these people are uh, Bob Greenblatt. They, are, they have been so tremendous to me, and they want to do The Apprentice again. See, I give up because it gets good ratings. You understand it better than anybody. If it gets good ratings, forget it. You can be a terrible human being if you're on television. If you get good ratings, you're the king. And if you, if you can be the nicest guy in the world. And it's very simple. You know, we, got, we had a great season. Uh, we continue to have great seasons. So I give up They a have lot. to be pretty upset, don't they? They're very upset. They're very upset. They want to do it again. They, I mean, they came up to see me. And these are wonderful people. These are great people. Now, they like me because I get ratings, right? Just like you're going to get great ratings whenever the hell you put this on. <laughs> I promise you that. But, um, but I, I do, for whatever reason, people like to watch. And I love the concept of The Apprentice because it was educational. You can teach people things. You can teach people about money and life. Anyway, it became a tremendous success, as you understand, and would be today. But I give up a lot. I give up. Whoever gave up? Mark Burnett called me. He said, Donald, they want to give you a major renewal. This was two days ago. They want to give you a major renewal. You're like the only guy I've ever heard of that turned down a renewal from a major network on a major show. And the reason is because you think the country because is Because I am screwed. looking at this very seriously, because I am not playing games, and because I'm tired of watching politicians give away the country and destroy our country. We're not going to have a country. And I said it before, we are going to be another Detroit if we don't change our ways in this country. This whole country is going to be Detroit, believe me. National Journal, one potential problem for Trump's rollout is his past reticence to release his tax returns. Given his status as an international business titan, his tax forms would be a gold mine for opposition researchers on the right and the left. Are you putting Well, it's not really a problem for me. First of all, my financials, they don't ever say that because they got a load of my financials. Last time, I released my financials, and they say I was the only candidate in the history of running for election that released financials and wasn't going to run, okay? I mean, I released my financials, if you remember, and they were phenomenal. And that solved lots of different things. I mean, nobody said anything negative once they saw it. Because they, and by the way, now they're much better. But just so you understand, on taxes, hey, I'm a businessman. I'm not the president right now. I want to fight like hell to pay as little tax as possible. I mean, I'm telling it like it is. You know, Warren Buffett can say all about, you know, well, we should pay more tax. It's OK, and I don't disagree. I'm just saying this. I'm a businessman. I fight like hell. I give a lot of things away. I give land trusts away. I give lots. It's all deductions and deductions. They have more deductions and other things, some good, some bad. Legally. Legally, sure. But I want to tell you right now, I have no problem with giving my tax returns, but I would tell you up front, a stupid person, a really stupid person, is paying a lot of tax. If you're in business, I, again, I'm in business for myself and for my family. I want to take care of my kids, my this. I give a lot of money to charity. Well, I don't mind, you know, if I'm paying less because I'm smart because I have the best lawyers and because I have the best accounting firms in Washington. I have lawyers in Washington. I pay millions of dollars. And I'll give away this. I'll give away that. I'll be entitled to certain deductions that I never even heard about. I have no idea why I'm getting them, but I'm entitled to deductions. So I have tax returns that will be up to the ceiling. I mean, literally, which is ridiculous, OK? It's ridiculous how complex the code is. But I have tax returns that will go from here practically to that ceiling, and maybe beyond. That's a pretty high ceiling. And I'm proud of the fact, as a businessman, I want to pay as little tax as possible. So I wouldn't say, oh, gee, like Romney was sort of you know, embarrassed. He didn't want, uh, he, he, he did it wrong. We're working for ourselves right now. We're working for our employees. I got a lot of employees. I have thousands. I have employed tens of thousands of people over the years. Okay, tens of thousands, Brad. And they're all happy. They made money. 
health care taken care of, education taken care of, big jobs all over the place. I mean, I bought Turnberry in Scotland. Now, that doesn't help us too much, but, you know, I like to make good investments, right? When I'm finished, I would love to give it all up. I'll let Ivanka, I'll let my boys, I'll let my family run the business. It's great business. They can run it. I just don't want them doing major deals, okay? Because <laughs> if they do a major deal, who knows what happens? But it's a great business. But I'd like to put the same brain power to work for the country to make our country rich again so that we can afford all of the things that I men mentioned before, including Social Security, including our veterans who are getting the shaft, including building up our military. Because this is a time we're cutting back. Being in the real estate business, I get listings all the time. A military base for sale, an Army base, an Air Force base, or this. I keep saying, how many bases do they have? I'm constantly getting listings of military things, Brett, that are for sale. And I say to myself, man, it's a lot. I want to build up the military. But at the same time, I'll be able to lower taxes, because I'm going to take all of our money away. You go to China. They're building bridges all over the place. Where do you see bridges being built? We don't build. We used to build. We're building one in New York. It's got a huge cost overrun already. The one in San Francisco. You know who built that one? The Chinese. San Francisco Bay, built by the Chinese. We can't build our own bridges. Those things will all change. You go to China, you see highways like you've never seen. You go to places like Saudi Arabia. You go to places like Qatar. You'll see airports like you wouldn't even believe is possible. Then you go to Kennedy, LaGuardia, LAX, and Los Angeles. It's like a third world country. And I told a story the other day. I was at LaGuardia. And for some reason, I walked through the airport, and I see a terrazzo floor that's 30, 40 years old, and it had potholes in it. So terrazzo, we're talking about interior, right? They fixed the potholes with asphalt. So you have a white terrazzo floor that's exhausted. I mean, you talk about tired, this thing is exhausted. But they put asphalt. So you're walking over asphalt, which is an exterior material for cars, for roads. It wouldn't have even cost much more if you knew what you're doing to do it properly. But really properly, rip it up and do it nice. And I'll guarantee that asphalt costs a fortune. But you have asphalt potholes all over the place. I'm saying to myself, what kind of a country is this? We're talking LaGuardia. We're talking Kennedy. We're talking about LAX. We're talking about our major airports. And then you go to Qatar, uh, Dubai. I'm doing big jobs in Dubai. You want to see an airport? The plane lands, and the pilot said, I've never seen a runway like this. It goes on forever. It's like a piece of glass. Our runways are a mess. Our, our airports are a disgrace. Our bridges and roads, you know, our tunnels and bridges and roads are unsafe. So an infrastructure project Well, who's better than Trump? Trump? I'm the best builder. Who's better than Trump? And I know how to do it inexpensively. I mean, these guys, they spend money to build a building, you know, $3 billion to build a veteran's hospital. $3 billion. I say, how can you spend $3 billion? $300 million, maybe. But how do you spend $3 billion to build a hospital, and then it gets built, and it's no good? Because they don't know what they're doing, and they're crooked. I mean, you know, to be honest. The ones that make a lot of money are the lobbyists. You look at the lobbyists. Every time somebody that I'm friendly with wants to make a deal, they go hire all these lobbyists. And the lobbyists are totally in the pocket of the politicians, many of them. I'm not saying all of them, but many of them. And the politicians are afraid to go against the lobbyists because that lobbyist gives them a lot of campaign contributions. So they vote for the wrong thing. This is the way it is. One thing with me, lobbyists have no impact on me, Brad. No impact whatsoever. I would do what's right for the country. And it's time that somebody like that, I think I do the best job. Nobody could come close. But it's time that somebody like that happens. It has to happen. You're going to self-fund your campaign? I'd self-fund, yeah. I'd self-fund, 100%. Now, uh, later on, if people want to make contributions, I like that, because I like people having an investment in the campaign, literally an investment in the campaign. But nobody's going to come along and say, as they do with politicians, I want to be the ambassador to France. I want to be the ambassador to, to, you know, to some other place. That's what they do. I'm, I'm going to raise you a million dollars. I want to be the ambassador to a certain country. I want to be in Sweden, you know, they say, I w my parents were born in Sweden. I want to be the ambassador. I'm raising you $5 million. He's going to be the ambassador to Sweden. None of that crap is going to happen if it's with me. I put the most capable people. One other thing, I know the toughest, the smartest people. I deal with them all the time, Wall Street. We have some people that are just truly great. 
people to negotiate. They're not nice. They're not nice people. You may not like them. Your wife may say, I don't ever want to be with that person again. But they're brilliant negotiators. I know who they are. I know the good ones. I know the bad ones. I know the ones that are overrated. There are some that you report on that are totally overrated. They're not good at all, but people think they are. I would pick people where China wouldn't have a chance. They wouldn't have a chance. So just to finish, very, very strong in the military, very strong in taking care of our veterans, very important. And to do all that, we have to take all of our jobs back from China and many other countries. And we can't let Mexico get going because they're really hurting us. You're not a stranger to the publicity. This is People Magazine. This is an article about your beautiful family. Yes. Um, that's are, very nice of them. I love people. It's a great, great spread. Are they ready for this? Nobody knows if anybody's ready. It's a tremendous burden on a family. There's no question about it. I see presidents. I mean, I look at President Obama. You know, you, you, they, people age. I watched Lyndon Johnson. He looked vibrant, and then he looked like he was an old man. He couldn't do it anymore. And he was a tough cookie. It, it's a tremendous burden on a family. And I understand that. And I explained it to Ivanka and Don and Eric and Tiffany. I mean, I explain it to everybody. And I explain it to my wife. I have a great wife. I have a great wife. She's an elegant woman. She's a good woman. She's got a tremendous heart. But I said, our country is dying. And the politicians are not going to change that. And many of them are friends of mine. And they come up to my office. You know, most of the guys that are running on the Republican side have been up to my office. Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton, I know them very well. But they're not going to do it. It's not going to get done. It's not going to get done. They all sort of, you know, they come up. I don't want to mention names, but you can just sort of look at your logs. But they come up and they sit in my office. First thing is, I love your support, but are you running? Because they don't know either. I may surprise a lot of people, and I'm not doing this for fun. There was one magazine that said, Trump has a great time doing this. I don't. I don't. I'd rather be doing many other things. Well, let me uh, short lightning round on your potential competition. First of all, if you get through, Hillary Clinton. Well, I think she's got some big problems. I, I think she's got a huge email problem, and uh, I think that's going to have to be cleared up. And, you know, I'm not so sure. Don't forget, when she ran against Obama, it was a lock. It was going to be a lock, and all of a sudden, he came out of nowhere and he ended up winning. So you never know in politics. It's called life and politics. You never know what's going to happen. But I think she's got some very big problems, and I think she has a very, very potentially big legal problem with respect to the emails and erasing all of those emails. I think that's a big problem. Vulnerable? I think she's vulnerable, yeah. All right, in the GOP, Jeb Bush. I just think the last thing this country needs is another Bush. He gave us, his brother gave us Obama. The last few months of his brother's administration were a total catastrophe. Uh, Iraq was started by George Bush, and Jeb was right there. They gave us a Supreme Court Justice, uh, Roberts, who basically approved Obamacare, which was a shocker to everybody, and that was a Bush appointee, and Jeb wanted Roberts. But the last thing we need, he's into federal government with respect to education, Common Core, totally in favor of it. I think that's a killer for him in the primaries, if you want to know the truth. You're not I, for it. I'm totally for, I'm for local education, 100%. And his, his stance on immigration, if you remember his statement on love, they come in for love. They come in for love. Well, what is that all about? They come in for love. And so I, I just think the last thing we need is another Bush. You check the box Hispanic and the voter registration. You see that? Well, that's a positive. You know, it's a positive. He will, he will do probably better with Hispanic. Do you know the funny thing? I like owning Doral. I'm right in the middle of a very, very Spanish area. Uh, Latin area, Venezuelans all over. I mean, it's great. I have fantastic relationships. They don't want to see people pouring into the country. You know, they're working and they're working hard. They don't want to see it. So, you know, it's not just like, let's let everyone in and your Spanish population is going to love you. They don't want to see people pouring into the country either. You will be surprised at the numbers. Scott Walker. Really nice guy. Came up to see me. I helped him in his campaign a lot. He gave me a beautiful plaque. Uh, we have to see what's going on with Wisconsin. I mean, Wisconsin's not doing so well, which actually surprised me. I looked at something the other day in Time Magazine, and it was two paragraphs on a bigger story that Wisconsin is not doing well, and it's way below projections. And I was very surprised to see it, to be honest with you. And that was part of a bigger story 
but it got me. I like him a lot personally. I love that he took on certain fights that a lot of people don't have the guts to take on. So I respect him in that way. We have to see what's going to happen with Wisconsin. Marco Rubio. I don't know him. I was really surprised that he would run if he runs. I mean, we'll see. But I was really, really surprised uh, because everyone said he's very close to Bush. And if Bush runs, and certainly Bush certainly seems like he's going to run, they all said that Marco Rubio wouldn't run. I, I, I don't see it. You know, I don't see it. I, he's a nice guy. I don't know him. Rand Paul. I know him very well. Like him a lot. Um, he, uh, I actually played a round of golf. He called up. He said, I'd love to play a round of golf with you. And we did. And uh, he did something very nice. Somebody asked from the press, did, you, did he beat Trump in golf? And the press agent said, or whoever it was, said, yes, he beat Trump. And Rand Paul didn't beat me. And he put out a, a notice that he did, which I thought was very cool, if you want to know. You understand that. Yeah, well, Being you're a an good athlete, golfer. Be, I'm a good golfer. And, and we had a great time. I like Rand Paul. I think he's going to have to do a lot more in the military, as far as I'm concerned, because I think we need more than ever before in the history of this country, we need strong military. And we need really high quality material. You know, this is no longer the day of the soldier over here and a soldier over there, both in uniforms, both, you know, one has a different color uniform and they're shooting. This is now people that you don't see, people that you can't trust like the Iranians. I don't believe you can trust the Iranians at all. And people that have weapons that are so sophisticated and so deadly, like never before in our history. We have to have an unbelievably powerful military. And that's maybe where I'm getting lost with Rand. Now, Rand is trying to ratchet that up a little bit, but my attitude is seriously powerful military. Ted Cruz. Another man, I like him a lot. Um, I, I think he's a very vibrant guy, smart guy, uh, very rhetorical. But we don't need rhetoric. We need somebody almost, it's not even, it's not even like, it's a, we need somebody that's going to get the job done. Uh, for some reason, whenever they mention Ted Cruz, they mention the next question is the birth of stuff. I wasn't going to ask you. Uh, you I, I'm, that's great that you did. And I just say, it's another problem that he has that nobody has. Because, you know, the Democrats, you don't think they're going to sue? So what happens if they sue and they win? I don't know. I hope he can run. I hope he can win, run. But, but what is going to happen if the Democrats sue and they win? And he's chosen as the candidate. Do we have no candidate? So I don't know. I like Ted Cruz. I like Rand. I like all of them. But in my opinion, the one person that can make our country rich again is Trump. A couple more things. Are you religious? I'm, I'm pretty religious. Went to church on Easter. People don't realize I'm Presbyterian, Protestant Presbyterian. Uh, and I went to Sunday school for years in Queens. And I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a believer. Am I religious like some people? Probably not but I am religious. Um, what is happening to Christians and Jews, but for some reason, the focus now is on Christians. I'll tell you what, that, that wouldn't happen if I'm at the helm. When they kill 350 people because they're Christian, and we have a president that won't even say that. He calls them terrorists. He doesn't talk about where they're coming from, what they thought. They killed people because they're Christians. I will tell you, Christians and Jews are going to be protected if I run and if I win. They will be protected like never, ever before. As you know, in some of those early states, evangelical Christians make up a pretty significant block of voters. How do you think you would do with them? I think I'd do great with them. I think I'd do great. Um, I have a very good marriage, but I had two marriages. Uh, but I think I'd do great with them. I think that uh, I am Protestant, which helps, I guess. I am Presbyterian, which really helps. Uh, I have, uh, I've been confirmed. I have my confirmation picture all ready to go. <laughs> I was uh, actually much cuter than I am right now. Uh, I think I do very well. Look, they want to see the country be great again, and I'm the one to make the country great again. Otherwise, they're not going to have a country. They're not going to have a country. A lot of people know a lot about you, just from magazines, from TV, from, what is something that somebody doesn't know about you? 
Well, it's an interesting, well, first of all, my hair is real, okay? <laughs> you know, I write the haters and losers. I call them the haters and losers. You'll never get them back, so I don't care. Um, I actually wrote a tweet which got retweeted thousands of times. <laughs> Happy Easter to everyone, including the haters and losers. Well, I have haters and losers. I mean, you know, I call them haters and losers. Um, but whenever I read that I wear a piece, they say, Donald Trump has the worst hair piece I've ever, well, you immediately know it's going to be a bad article because they know it's not. But a lot of, because they write it, you know, a lot of people think I wear a wig. <laughs> I don't. So, you know, you mention things that people don't. Um, I think one of the things that people don't understand, I do have a big heart. I want to take care of people. And I'll fight to take care of people, much more than anybody else will. And I sort of said at the beginning of the interview, I'm conservative, but I have a very big heart. I want to take care of people. And the only way we can take care of people is to bring our country back. Otherwise, we, we won't have the money, we won't have the wherewithal to take care of people. But it sounds like a compassionate conservative, and we've heard that before. Well, I guess you have. but. The difference with George is, look, W. Bush. I saw oh, George Bush. He was a beauty. Look, there's a big difference. Look what happened to the veterans under George Bush and under Obama. It's a disaster what's going on. And there's no reason for that. There's absolutely no reason for that. I love people. I want to take care of people. I love this country. I also love what I do. I love my business. You know that because you know me a little bit, and I love what I do. I love that I'm building the old post office. I'm building this great hotel. By the way, right next to the White House, right between White House and Congress, right? And I love it. I mean, I love going in there. I love dealing with the contractors, getting it built. It's already ahead of schedule. It's under budget. It's going to be spectacular. I like that. But I'm willing to give all of that up. I mean, I love going to parts of the world where I'm doing deals. One of the things that I have had a great deal of experience with is dealing with foreign people at the highest level. I've made billions dealing with China. I've made a lot of money dealing with China and the smartest people in China, and I came out on top. I made a lot of money dealing with people from other countries. I met a lot of the leaders. You know, in a certain way, and somebody actually wrote about it the other day, in a certain way, I have more experience dealing with foreign leaders than these politicians that sit in the Senate floor and just want to show up for a vote. Just from business. When somebody hears you say, I like to take care of people, and their alarm goes in their head if they're conservative and says, is he for bigger government? Is he for a government that is a nanny state? That's okay, maybe I'll what they exactly. hear. I mean, it's pretty simple. I'm for a very powerful military. The number one thing we have to protect our people, military, because the world wants to kill us. They want to destroy us. So I'm for stronger than anybody else. I'm for a strong military. And I'll be able to make a tremendous amount of money by taking back the stupidity that's been done over the years and making our military strong. With that being said, we have to make our government smaller in so many ways. For instance, education should be local. We talked about that. Uh, medical can be very much more localized. And you're going to get much better treatment, much better care, and it's going to be less expensive. There are so many different things you can do. The one thing and the one element that I feel so strongly about is we have to build back up our military. And that is something that I want to make very powerful, very strong. But I'm going to fund it by stopping some of the things happening over in other parts of the world with our money. Because they take our money like taking candy from a baby. It's that easy. You know, it's very interesting. I have friends from China, very smart. They call me and they say, Donald, I cannot believe, actually, that we get away with what we're doing to the United States. Now, they don't know I'm going to be on your show saying that. And I'm not using their names. But people from other countries, including Mexico, I have a friend in Mexico, he can't believe what they get away with. He can't even believe it. Because we have the wrong people. The wrong people. The go, no go time, the decision? I would say uh, June, July. I'm going to make a very, very strong decision. And if I go, I go. I go, and I, and look, very simple. I want to make our country great again. It's a very simple campaign. And I don't know anybody else that can do it. Thanks for the time. Thank you very much.